So okay. uh, my question is about the relationship between um, economic theory and inequality. In particular, I, I would like to ask you what kinds of modifications or integrations should be made in theoretical models in order to uh, better explain the uh, inequality dynamics or, uh, as you argue uh, yesterday, for example, we should give up with models and focus our attention mainly on empirical works. Well, our basic argument I, I put together in this, for this seminar that I've been making in other forms is that we, that we need a unified economics, unifying the macroeconomics that we, at a global level, that is in the spirit of John Maynard Keynes and post Keynesians, the institutionalists, and the distribution economics, which has been there for a long time sort of reserved to the microeconomists. Well, the fact is, if you unify them together under the banner of a macroeconomics, you can explain a great deal of what's going on very effectively, and you don't need the micro at all. Uh, so, uh, I guess my view is that. Most of the mainstream discussion, in fact, all of it, on inequality has been caught up in a set of preconceptions uh, which can be dispensed with. The idea that things are settled in labor markets. I ask my students, have you ever been to the labor market? Have you ever been in the labor market? Did you, did you negotiate your wage? And, and did you get improve your chances of employment by, by offering to cut your wage compared to somebody you were competing with? I don't think so. This is not the way the world works. Employers have a wage structure, and they, they, they bring you in at the ground floor, and you, and you, you, you stay in and, and develop a relationship. This is an institutional matter, not a market matter. Uh, so the whole idea that this is a supply and demand, you know, this is OK. Maybe if you're looking for someone to, to, uh, you know, that, um, to do day labor uh, in, in areas where there are a great many immigrants, you go down and you hire them off, so off the street. But, that's not the way. That's not the way the, the world works in advanced societies, or even in, in less advanced societies, for the most part. Uh, so, um, dispense with that with that a priori category, and ask yourself: What does the evidence show us about the movement of inequality? The evidence shows us that it's strongly influenced by the major developments in global finance. Right? That is to say, there's the, power, the, the concentration of high incomes in new sectors and, and, and in the, the power of the financial intermediaries. It's about the interest rate and the relationship between debtors and creditors. Uh, it's about the movement of the exchange rate. It's about these things which are, are the sum and substance of how people who actually run global financial capitalism, what they work with on a daily basis. No surprise. Their entire objective is to make themselves wealthier at the expense of everybody else. And so our, if you have a progressive viewpoint and you think this probably should be controlled, your objective should be a regulatory framework and a countervailing power that permits the broader society to have a reasonable share of the total product. And that's a political uh, and institutional matter. Um, now, that's not what mainstream microeconomics wants you to think. Because mainstream microeconomics basically doesn't want you to think in critical terms about the way that society is actually run. Um, but um, I'm afraid looking at evidence uh, is a useful way to stimulate those dangerous and subversive critical thoughts, which I, for your career purposes, I strongly recommend you repress. Thank you. I get away with it because you see, I already, I'm already attended, yes. and I've been there for a long time. So. But don't 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 pay any attention to me. I'm a, I'm a dangerous um, sort of person. But <laughs> are you talking like this because you have your age, so you have just your position at the university, and then you can finally say what you think? Or you were like this even at the beginning of your career? Oh, I was always like this. I uh, okay. I'll confess that I started my career uh, having gone through graduate school. Uh, and having understood what was happening in economics, uh, and I had one basic requirement for my career, which was that I would never ever be an assistant professor. The most humiliating job in the world, 
when you're on seven years probation to show your superiors that you think exactly like them even if you don't. Well, it's not familiar. So I went directly from graduate school to be a senior policymaker. It was much better. <laughs> uh, I, had this, I, I was 29 years old and became staff director of the Joint Economic Committee. Ronald Reagan was president. I was the coordinator of the, of the opposition. I had a wonderful time. I had 50 people on my staff. Uh, we had control of congressional hearings, reports, investigations. Um, it was uh, it was just one of the best things you could do for four years. And then I went to the academy to a public policy school, not an economics department, uh, where uh, that kind of experience was not frowned upon. Uh, and I lived happily ever after. That's all I can say. Uh, so I, I highly recommend um, that uh, you know one think carefully about about if you if you if you plan to have uh, you know uh, keep your independence of mind about how and how long you do this in this part of the I barely I had a lot of privileges and advantages I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah. uh, I didn't I didn't come to these views sometime later in my career. I mean after all I was brought up with them. So I had a huge advantage in the sense that, that, that I, I could see what was happening to my father's position in economics uh, and how basically he was, his entire perspective was being squeezed out of existence. Uh, and so positioning myself to be, to, 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 um, to, to have a successful academic career, uh, at least I had the advantage of having my eyes opened at a very early stage. Um, and Piketty's main implication of his work is that as long as the growth rate of GDP is greater than the interest rate, the inequalities keep growing, and since a greater share of income accrues to capitalists, what's your take on that? Well, um, the interesting, well, at least one of the many interesting things about this claim that the uh, interest rate is higher than the growth rate. Uh, is that in the data that Piketty presents himself in the, the 2014 book, Capital for the 21st Century, it's not true. It doesn't show up. In order to make it appear to show up, and you glance at those, at the graphs in that paper, one of my students, Noah Wright, did a very good paper on this, I highly recommend, called uh, uh, I think it's quantitative visualization in capital for the 21st century, appeared in the real world of economics uh, review. Um, and what he did was to, um, what, what Piketty did was two things. One was he distorted the time frame of his graphs. So the first 5,000 years is, 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 is uh, maybe two centimeters, and then the next 500, two centimeters, and then where he wants you, your eye to be drawn, it's a 20 or 30 or 40 interval to completely distort from that point of view. And the other thing he did was where the data still was to support the argument, he came up with data points uh, and put some in the, in the graphs for some very interesting dates. 2100 AD, 2200 AD. Now I know there's some calendars with numbers like but I think, that as far as I know, the Christian calendar so far only goes up uh, to 2019. And 2100 is 81 years in the future. 2200 is 181 years in the future. Uh, where Professor Piketty finds data for those years, I don't know. I don't have access to it. Uh, and I'm not sure what archive he got them from. I mean, maybe he has special access to the Almighty and got, got an advanced view. But the fact is, it's not listed as a projection. It's not identified as such. It's just right there, 2100, 2200, and the numbers go up, and the inequality explodes, and we're back in the 19th or the 18th century, or God knows when, the 12th century. No, don't think so. The 20th century uh, has introduced uh, Social Security, and unemployment insurance, and tr mass trade unions, and uh, nutrition assistance, and uh, let's say, uh, universal health insurance in most countries, and a whole bunch of things which are still there. They've been attacked and weakened, but they're still there. Right? The mass middle class is still there. 
we are not back in the world of Jane Austen and Charles Dickens uh, on a the Balzac. As much as Mr. Pickett thinks we might be, those things didn't exist. Minimum wages didn't exist. Right? So it was being a little realistic is it's not simply the case that there was an aberration in the middle decades of the 20th century. We well, yeah, could accomplish something that neither uh, the interest rate hasn't gone below above the growth rate uh, on any sustained basis, uh, and nor have we eliminated all of the structure of modern society. If we did, we wouldn't have the world population that we have. Well, exactly what happens when you break apart a society that has certain institutions, even if they're totally imperfect. Life expectancy collapses. That's what happened in the USSR in the 1990s. Male life expectancy dropped to 56 years old of age. Like almost 20 years. Violence, alcoholism, depression, suicide. You can see some of that going on in the US now, but it's not nearly close. I mean, it's in fact, those populations are supported because the uh, um, because because the social institutions that exist to support them. So the progressive tax on capital as a consequence of his analysis, I mean, do you oppose this idea or do you think that we have all the capital? Is universal wealth tax? Yeah. Well, it requires a universal tax authority with, with universal knowledge of just how much that painting in your attic is actually worth on a market to market basis. I mean, it's okay to fantasize about these things, but in the real world, you need to have tax authorities that actually have uh, an, a taxable base. And that income is a proven case of a taxable base that you can track, you can do withholding, uh, you can assess, uh, and uh, wealth is not. Uh, property you can tax, land you can tax. There's a lot to be said for taxing land more effectively. Land owners don't like it, but land is there, you can appraise it. You can tax it, you can sense it. You know. uh, and again, I come back to the, I've said many times, the estate tax, you only tax wealth, do it once. Do it when people die. That's when the estate passes, you can freeze it, you can appraise it, you can levy a tax on the value. So it happened when our parents died. Okay. And that gives people who have a lot of wealth an enormous incentive to offload it. Not to their kids because the gift tax will apply, but to, let's say, a nonprofit institution. So if you look at the United States, why does the US have a lower unemployment rate than Europe? Because it has a vast nonprofit sector, higher education, health care, uh, religious institutions, cultural institutions, all of them named after some otherwise undistinguished rich person who uh, desperately does not want to have their income disappear, their wealth disappear. Uh, and, and so they, 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 when they get to a certain age, in their 50s and 60s, they start writing big checks to philanthropy. Right? That's a kind of peculiar way to run a society that 8% of American employment is in those institutions. Me, for example, I, mean, I work for a public university that is overwhelmingly funded by, uh, by the, I mean, very heavily funded by this kind of private clinician. So, uh, it's, it, it, re it also has a very good Keynesian effect because it takes accumulated wealth and turns it into spending streams. Right? So it's con the consumption uh, of the employees of these institutions supports the economic activity in general. Makes the company more resilient. Much better way to deal with it than to try and pretend that you're going to have an annual levy on the market value of, of, of the whole diversity of people's holdings. That's just a formula for making a full employment uh, program for appraisers. <laughs> and more tax lawyers than appraisers, especially appraisers. Um, and you have argued ever since that we should frame inequality on a macroeconomic perspective rather than on a microeconomic perspective. But do you think that the argument of the skill bias techno technological change has some merit in explaining inequality? Zero. 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 It has absolutely zero merit. Now, if it were true, uh, if it had been true that the situation in the 1990s during the boom years when inequality and pay structures actually declined, wouldn't have occurred. Right? I mean, the notion that there's some kind of mysterious process whereby employers demand higher levels of skill 
and your greater levels of education are working to acquire the skills. I mean, come on, you're in graduate school, you can compare that to your own experience, I'm sure you find nothing of the kind is actually happening. Uh, so, uh, the reality is that the introduction of these advanced technologies is skill saving. It means that I don't have to know how to type, error free. I'm old enough to have had you know, secretarial assistants when I was very young, of extremely skilled people who could type letters and hold reports without making a single mistake. Right? It's actually necessary now. Autocorrect will, will introduce new mistakes. <laughs> also correct all ones for you already. You don't have to have that skill. You don't have to have an accounting skill. Uh, you used to have to have a bookkeeping skill. All these things have become automated. There's lots of, lots of skill saving. There's also capital saving. These, this kind of equipment's much cheaper than for what it does than, than a similar constellation of equipment that have been 30, 40 years ago. So those things are important, but, but the notion that they're making the workforce is a much smarter, or increasing the employer's demand for super smart people. I mean, think about it in a very elementary way. It would, it, when I was uh, when I was your age. Uh, you go into a shop and you, you, you pay with, with something that was called cash. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if so, or if you've never have you seen it. And then there would be usually a middle aged lady who was sitting at the cash register who was a highly trusted employee because she was handling the cash. And she would make change for you and she would make the computation in her head because she was accustomed to doing it like that. And she'd sit there and do that all day. And at the end of the day, the amount of cash that was in the drawer would correspond to what the record said because she was honest and trusted, highly skilled, now a stable employee. Now, first of all, you don't even touch the cash. You just want to put a, a piece of plastic in there, and it, does, it doesn't matter whether the employee is trustworthy or not. Everything's handled, and therefore the employee can be much lower, much less well paid, and much less, much more transient. That's not that's skill. If that's that's affecting skill, it's not improving the demand for skill, it's diminishing. It's clear. It's clear. And you think, well, okay, there are places where there are really very few um, uh, parts of the economy which are, where, where, where really being uh, a, um, a highly educated person is still useful. Uh, ceremonially in academic life, it helps to be educated because we pretend it's important, but that's not an economic contribution. Basically, it was um, you know, quantitative financial engineers, but their reputation suffered in something called the Great Crisis. So I don't buy it at all. I think it was, in, it was a way of, of um, it, was a, it was a particular fantasy of the neoclassical mainstream intended to focus attention on a, a broad phenomenon rather than what was actually happening, which was the concentration of income in, 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 under in, in basically the power of finance. And once you start looking at the data, it's obvious. Uh, give you an example. Uh, in the United States, we did a measure of, of in, income inequality across counties. So between these small geographic units. The U.S. has a lot of counties. There are 3,150 of them. And in the 1990s, from 93 to 2000, if you take five counties out of the mix, half of the increase in inequality goes away. If you take 15, the 15 that contribute the most, it all goes away. So what are the five that take that count for half of it? Well, there's New York, New York, which is where the banks are, and then there's three counties in Northern California. Santa Clara, San Mateo, San Francisco, that's called Silicon Valley. And then there's one county in Washington State, King County, Seattle, which is where Microsoft was, is. That's it. I mean, these are astronomical incomes recorded by very small numbers of people in very, very restricted places. This is what's going on. And that's not because of skill bias, it's because you had a boom in that financially driven movement in a particular sector dominated the growth of income. Um, I, I have one, um, the final one. Uh, since we are part
part of an international group called Rethinking Economics, which tries to promote pluralism via an interdisciplinary pluralism, uh, methodological and theoretical. Uh, we would ask you if you had the possibility to modify uh, the standard academic curriculum of uh, undergraduate and graduate economic students. Um, where would you start and from what would you start and uh, yes, which, which would be the, your priorities in this sense? Well, um, I do have that opportunity at least to do it on a pilot basis. Um, so I'll tell you about a couple of exercises that I've actually carried out. I was asked, or partly I persuaded my colleagues to ask me, uh, to teach a class to entering master students in public policy. But they're basically my kind of actually have further economics with any from all over the world. Um, on the international economy. Um, they typically, of course, you get a course in international economics that somebody builds a model two by two by two, you know, labor and capital in two countries two factors and two products, and, and then they have to demonstrate that David Ricardo was right after all, commanded and managed, and on and on and on. I can see you nodding in exasperation, exasperated recognition, so at least I know that the subject hasn't changed since I had to pass through it, which is already for almost 50 years ago. Um, so, what I did, I said, well, we're going to take up the three topics that were specified there. Trade, finance, development. And we're going to start from the top, rather from the bottom, not from some abstract model. But we're going to start from the, what, when, in trade, we're going to talk about production versus open, we're going to talk about it in historical context, talk about how the United States developed and how China is developing now, and talk about the, the relationship between rich and poor countries and what what it means to have a diversified industrial this kind of thing. Uh, principles of increasing returns, which are uh, central to understanding why, for example, the US became the leading industrial power in the start of the 20th century. Um, finance, well, start with, instead of, I don't know exactly whether how finance is taught, instead of starting with this notion of how to copy money or whatever it is, let's talk about the where the idea of economic development comes from is historically very specific. It didn't exist in the colonial period. It's a post-colonial idea. I think it was important to develop an idea of development economics because the world was in a cold war. Now, there was a development process that was going on. It was called the Soviet Union. Right? And there, in the West, this was, a, this was a major threat. So development economics was developed in the post-war period to provide some idea that there was an alternative to the Soviets. Which, to some degree, maybe there was. Um, in fact, proved that there was. But the notion that development went through a number of phases, initially sort of, sort of a hard capital investment kind of approach, growth theory, uh, and to something which is much more human development and sustainable development in these concepts. And then the students who have encountered these things and of course, many of them come from other countries and therefore have encountered the idea of the exchange rate. And you know, they're not naive about financial markets because they lived in a world of multiple uh, of means of exchange. Uh, you know, they, they grasp and they, and, and they, they, they see the, the issues that they face in, the, in, in the sort of, you know, this local context. Um, and then, of course, my international students can't break. They teach my American students because they yeah, they, they know they tend to have much, uh, for obvious reasons, a much bigger uh, view of the world to come, uh, and to have seen it in many cases from the perspective of, of, of coming from a poorer country, students from Nigeria or Tunisia, or wherever they may be. Uh, so this is all I find extremely uh, 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 exhilarating. I read totally, I've done, I've done it once, and that was just, it was one of the great experiences I've had in the um, Because uh, the, the students of the art, they, 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 they're a group of reaching to concepts which are not completely counterintuitive, and they 
teach each other. Um, the other thing I did, which is a class on inequality as such, uh, and again, uh, rather than sort of imposing these categories, labor markets, capital, labor, marginal productivity, all this perfect competition, all these things which come out of an idealized textbook vision. Um, I think we go and look at the world and ask ourselves what, uh, what accounts for the patterns that we can measure. Um, and that uh, then brings us back into this relationship between distribution and what we call macro and financial phenomena. And again, the students connect these things. Uh, so uh, I think that's, that, that, that's some examples. I mean, lots of different things that one should do. Uh, but the most important thing is to have a fresh view of what the appropriate um, categories are, what the appropriate observational units are, what you're trying, what, what the underlying history and the politics of the subject are. And unfortunately, of course, if you start with a textbook, that's completely obscure. I'll give you one example, the very basic notion of supply and demand. Supply, what does supply and demand convey? It conveys there's a balance of forces. The demand curve and the supply curve meet. And the world is at peace in equilibrium. Right? This is the concept. Where does this come from? Confucius. It comes from China. And it was brought to Europe in, uh, anti uh, in the ancien regime in France by the physiocrats, by Francois Quenet, right? with the court of Louis XV. Right? Well, you, know, you, want, you want eternal peace under the celestial emperor, that's, uh, that's, that, that's the perspective. But it, 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 and it's preserved in the textbooks to this day, even though there's no other scientific discipline remotely resembles this. Everything else moved on, at least with Darwin in the 1850s into an evolutionary and uh, constantly changing developing framework. Physics, biology, and all of them are totally different. Uh, but economics is stuck really basically in a theological mindset that goes back to the, uh, uh, to the 18th century, to the, to the clock maker. So the theology could be included in curriculum, in economics curriculum? Say again? Theology could be included in the curriculum. Okay, so I, I, I think I'm going to call Theocratic economics, or theoclassical economics, yeah. that's the last term for theoclassical economics. But yes, I think for those of you who were raised in a properly raised in a good, good religious tradition, you can see this very clearly. This is uh, this is not what you call evolutionary thought mm -hmm. by any stretch. Um, so um, I, 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 I hope uh, that someday there will be a revival. In a, uh, evolutionary economics, but I'm afraid that what actually happens is that you get, you get different um, religious subcategories. It becomes like the Protestant Church, the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Baptists and so forth, with minor differences of, 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 of dogma. Uh, but uh, you know, they, they, what they can't give up is that. It is the pre scientific wonder. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for no, it's a pleasure. time. Yeah. Yeah. You can now so use that for whatever subversive purposes you may have. <laughs> <laughs> I laid it on as thick as I could. <laughs>